Um, uh, just a quick reminder, city council meetings are being held remotely due to the governor's stay at home order. It went into effect on March 26, 2020. And uh, if you're watching this, you obviously know how to find us. Um, so let's go ahead and have the roll call, Ms. Quintana. Good evening, Mayor. Uh, Mayor Bagley. Here. Council members Christensen. Here. Hidalgo Faring. Here. Martin. Here. Peck. Here. Rodriguez. Here. Good waters. Here. Mayor, you have a quorum. All right, great. Harold, do we have any, or actually city council, actually let's do Pledge of Allegiance. We don't have a flag here, but let's say it, preferably in unison, so I'm not ahead of everyone this time. All right. I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of the United, United States, States of, America, of America and to the Republic, the Republic for, which for which it stands, stands one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice, justice for, all. for all. Good job, Dr. Waters, you rocked it, you rocked it. By that, I mean, you didn't really, that's okay. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and do motions to direct the city manager to add agenda items to the future. Anybody? All right, I don't see anybody. So let's go ahead. Don, do we have any public comment tonight? We do, Mayor. We have about seven comments that I'm going to read for you tonight. Perfect. Uh, the first one is from Dave Larison, 2329 Squires Court. Dave says, there was breaking news late last week that the University of Colorado has dismissed atmospheric researcher, Dr. Detlef Helmig for unethical practice revolving around his public and private work. And there's a link to the article. The city of Longmont is paying Helmig's operation $150,000 annually for air quality sampling at Union Res, an outlay spurred on by local environmental activists. As a retired meteorologist familiar with Longmont atmospheric conditions, I've always questioned Helmig's air sampling conclusions. He cherry picks certain VOC readings with no proof that the source is Weld County oil and gas drilling. It amounts to a biased study similar to a push poll designed to get wanted results for the benefactor's agenda. I had a letter published in the Times call on November 30th, 2018 regarding Helmig's flawed work. In light of the new revelations from the University of Colorado, as well as large projected city budget shortfalls, I believe Dr. Detlef Helmig's contract should be terminated, terminated immediately by Longmont City Council. The next is from Mark Lauman. Um, his address 236 Sugar Bend Court. Mark says, golf is not essential. Opening up the golf courses sends a very bad message to the community. The pandemic is in full effect and our curve has not slowed. Do not encourage people that things are better or are fine. Opening up the golf courses sends a signal that things are normal again and shelter in place is not necessary, which will only cause an upswing in the number of people getting sick. Be, be careful with the message you send. Next is a message from Chris Vaswig, 1609 19th Avenue. This comment is regarding the lack of social distancing and overcrowding at some of our parks. I have been a Longmont resident for over 20 years now and truly love it here. And one of the things I'm most proud of is how much work and resources we have placed in our parks and open space system. Currently, there are many people enjoying the fruits of those labors. The issue currently is that there are too many people traveling to specific areas that results in overcrowding at certain parks and open space areas while leaving many of them empty. I do firmly believe that these are valuable resources and that we should be encouraging responsible use of our public areas during these times. Though it would seem that some restriction, restrictions may have to be place, placed in order to keep from having to resort to shutting down those resources to everyone. Living near McIntosh Lake, I can tell you firsthand that there are constantly crowds and too many people traveling to the lake for it to remain the safe place to enjoy the outdoors. My suggestion is to close the parking lots and prohibit street parking for non-neighborhood residents at some or all of our city parks and open spaces for the next few weeks to encourage residents to spread out to the parks and open spaces that are closer to home. At the very least, please consider changing the paths at McIntosh to single direction traffic to cut down on how close people are to each other. We need to ensure that we keep the recovery on track as we preserve the safety of all residents of Longmont and help to stop the spread of COVID-19 while still keeping our wonderful parks and open space areas open. Thank you. Next is a comment from Gail Allen uh, on Twin Peaks Circle. She says, I strongly feel you should not reopen the public golf courses at this time. It seems irresponsible considering the influx of people from other areas 
and is a recipe for increased viral transmission within our local neighborhoods and community. My specific concerns are as follows. Many homes directly back to our golf courses. My residence backs to the golf course and there's no landscape buffer or significant distance between my backyard patio and the tee box. I am personally concerned about the constant flow of golfers waiting at the tee in close proximity that may increase my chances of contracting the virus, particularly as I'm in a high risk group. Will you require all golfers to wear masks? As the governor has asked us to all wear in public places, how will you enforce this rule? Gov golfers seldom play alone. How are you going to restrict size and enforce social distance of non-family member groups? Are you going to require all golfer golfers walk the course or allow the use of golf carts? What are your procedures for sanitizing carts? How will you ensure that flags, cups, and ball cleaners are sanitized after each golfer? Do you feel confident all golfers will police themselves and sanitize golf equipment after use? How much money will it cost to keep sanitizing protocols in place with regards to staffing and cleaning? Golfing really is not a solitary sport. Despite what the governors may decide, we have the right as a home rule city to set our own rules. Our community is still not back to normal. We should not pretend that we are. We need to protect our vulnerable citizens. Opening golf courses for the new golf, for the few golfers who are impatient to play a round of golf during this pandemic does not make sense to me. Please hold off opening the golf courses until we are confident we can do so safely. And when we are also ready to open our other recreational facilities, such as pools, tennis courts, skate parks, and playgrounds, it's the right thing to do. The next one is from Abby Driscoll, 1304 Lupine Court. Abby says, as Sustainable Resilient Longmont had to cancel this year's Longmont Earth Day celebration, we are excited to be finding other ways to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. This event has always had youth and environmental education as a central focus. Indeed, it is our children's and future generations' lives at stake due to the threat of climate change. While this is a global issue in scope, I believe that there are things we can do locally to make an impact. Tomorrow on Wednesday, April 22nd, we are hosting a live webinar that will be a panel discussion with St. Brain Valley High School students about the challenging opportunities we face with climate change in our community and how to make a difference. We invite council members and the public to join us from noon to 1.30, find out what local youth are thinking regarding climate change, fossil fuels, local action, and their vision for the future. The panel discussion will be moderated by Marlo Baines, who is originally from Boulder and as co-youth director at Earth Guardians, has taken her passion for environmental causes all over the world. The four student panelists are Ashwini Shrista of Skyline High School, Maya Bobino of Maniwat High School, Ali Hummer, and Megan Newfield of Silver Creek High School. We are extremely inspired by these youth. When asked for a quote for our press release for the event, Silver Creek junior Ali Hummer, who has also been an active volunteer in our Earth Day Planning Committee, said, I'm very excited and honored to be a part of this panel. In these uncertain times, we have such a unique opportunity for self-reflection and contemplation. We can distinguish what is truly important to us and what we hold dear. As the earth begins to heal without our presence, many are realizing the significance of our actions and the necessity of a solution. This panel is an amazing way to express those feelings and give a platform to the voices that will be carrying the burdens of generations. COVID-19 is blind to race, age, and location, therefore has united the world in a way that has never been seen before. I hope that as we meet behind our screens, we can recognize this opportunity for togetherness and apply it to environmentalism. This is our world and we are all in it together. Thank you for your time and invite you to visit www.srlongmont.org where you can find the details for the webinar link and join us to listen to what these young people have to say. The future is in all of our hands. Happy Earth Day. Um, the next one is from Rachel Zelaya of Sustainable Resilient Longmont, 948 Rose Street. It's actually a proclamation request. Do you want me to read it, Mayor? Because it looks like it should go to the proclamation pipeline. I'm sorry, you're muted. <laughs> By now, I expect everyone to be reading lips. It's what, <laughs> how many weeks? No, the, uh, what I was going to say is that uh, Maria and I, uh, Maria Tostalo and I discussed not doing any proclamations until the end of May. Uh, we were getting some proclamations about like, for, I mean, put it in the pipeline, but uh, like we got a proclamation for, you know, uh, making April bike month. And I was like, well, uh, uh, I just, I mean, what, what's it going to look like? Meaning, uh, 
they can be biking in packs or they can be biking within six feet of each other. And so uh, there were there were a lot of of those types of announcements or proclamations that that just seemed we could put it off until after the after the. I won't read this one because it is actually the wording of a proclamation. Yeah, so just and go ahead and send it in the pipeline. The cool. Okay. Any? There's one more. Go ahead. One last one. Um, nope, it's a repeat. That's Abby again. So that's all I have. All right. Cool. All right. If there's no other presentations, Harold, let's move on to the COVID-19 update. All right. Can everyone hear me? Yep. All right. So we're going to um, go through a few points in this. Um, the first thing that I'm going to do is, is really talk about um, what we're doing uh, from a facility standpoint as it relates uh, to the information that we thought we heard from the governor's update yesterday. Uh, Jeff Zayak is on the line from Boulder County um, Public Health. And so I will start with my general overview and, and what we're going through as an organization in terms of preparing ourselves for various transition points and how we're gonna look at that. In addition, what we're also, I'm going to, we're then gonna to move to Dan and he'll cover a general EOC update and what we have. Um, in play this week. And we will then shift to Joni and Jessica who will do the business assistance update. And then to um, Kathy and Karen on the individual assistance. Uh, and then we'll go to Jeff on the Boulder County update. Um, Jeff's probably gonna have more detail based on the, the governor's um, press conference yesterday. Um, and so I'm gonna talk about a few points that, that we're keen on as an organization. Um, as you saw over the last couple of weeks, we've had a number of um, comments regarding golf courses. I would say that that's not unique to our community. Um, and once a week or multiple times a week, I have a conversation with our, um, with our um, with county administrators in Boulder County. And this has been something that we've all been talking about. Um, one of the things that we look at and that we're going to be looking at when we look at any of our facilities is really the specific activities that we have in the various facilities um, uh, that we operate on a daily basis. The one thing I will say is that not every facility and not every activity is created equal. And we have to keep in mind what the governor's orders are, um, the advice that we get from the Colorado Department of Health, the advice we get from Boulder County Department of Health, then the guidelines that are also out there from the Centers for Disease Control. And we evaluate all of that information when we're going to be looking at our facilities. And so I know that um, um, people want us to look at all of our recreational components as one or not. And we're gonna really take deep dives into those components and understand what that looks like. Um, we're going to base it on best practices and science, and as I said, input from various agencies. And the one thing I'll say, and no matter what we do, safety is always going to be paramount. And as staff, we would not make a recommendation to open a facility if we didn't feel like we could ensure the safety of our folks that work at the facility, the safety of the public that utilizes the facility. So at that point, what I will say is that we do know that uh, the Colorado Department of Public Health and Boulder County Health have both um, said that golf courses are allowed to be open. You may have seen recently that Denver has opened their golf courses. I know another a, a number of um, public courses are beginning to open. Private courses have never opened. Um, I want to tell council and the community that I specifically had a conversation with Jeff regarding the health and safety issues associated with golf courses and specifically asked him the question and said, if you have an issue with this, let me know, um, and we won't move forward. And Jeff can speak for himself, but he said, I'm good based on the level of risk. There is almost a page and a half of protocols that we have to undergo at golf courses in terms of everything that we have to comply with before we open. We're not there yet, because one of the major components is that people have to register online and have to be able to pay prior to uh, coming into golf. Walk-ups will not be allowed, and we're still working on those technology pieces as we speak to try to get that done. 
in addition to that, um, because walk-ups aren't allowed, we're actually going to have a check-in at the entrance um, when we get to the point where we can open it. We're going to have to check in actually at the entrance of the parking lot. So if you haven't reserved a tea time and you haven't paid for it, we're not even going to allow you to come into the parking lot. And then they're going to have requirements in terms of spacing in the parking lot and what that's going to. So we have adequate distancing there. I know there was a question about what are we going to do with masks? Um, we are going to require people to have masks and wear those masks where they can't properly social distance from other people. And so, um, you know, generally they're saying six to 10 feet. The analogy that we're going to use on some of the videos is it's like a driver in an arm's length away. And if you're inside of that, then you need to wear the mask because of social distancing and those in those protocols. Um, one of the things that we're really starting to see is we have multiple people going out to golf courses on a daily basis because we have a lot of people getting on and it's been an ongoing challenge for us. The other issue that we're starting to see is not only do we have people getting onto the golf course to play golf, we also have people getting onto the golf course to walk. I've heard people getting onto the golf course to picnic. And there's another safety issue starting to come into play. Um, because when golf balls are, are flying and moving that fast and you have people and they're not expected, that is a very dangerous condition. Um, in addition, I know there was a news story on Channel 9 actually really talking about the golf courses and they showed video that it was easier actually to manage and and force proper social distancing on a golf course than some of the other locations that have been talked about. Um, what are we going to do? in order to, sure, to ensure that um, all of the steps are being done and that folks are complying with them. We're actually gonna repurpose staff that can't be in other operations because we can't achieve proper social distancing. And they're gonna be out working to ensure that people are following all of the requirements. Again, those are things we're working on. Um, and once we can pull it together to ensure that it is a safe operation, that it is complying with the, um, the orders, established by the Colorado Department of Health and Boulder County Health, um, we will then evaluate when we can pull the trigger on that. At that point, I'll stop the golf courses and answer any questions. Um, I lost the mayor, but I'll say Council Member Christensen. <laughs> um, we had a constituent who wanted to know whether um, well, two questions. She wanted to know whether uh, private gyms would be open or our gyms would be open. But the other thing I wanted to ask about golf courses is, um, is this going to cost us more money than usual to run golf courses again? Because, you know, no. yeah, anyway. Actually, I, it, um, I'm not hearing that. Actually, it, 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 it um, it's actually the other case where it'll actually generate revenue um, that we're not generating now um, in order to do that. And the other option that it does, to tap into the gym question, um, when we say we look at each facility, um, and this sort of will bleed over into what we what I heard from the governor, and if I miss this, Jeff will correct me. But generally what I heard yesterday was, we're still limiting any gathering um, it's got to be 10 or less. And so when you start getting into our other facilities, when we talk about things like, and this is work that we have to do as we start looking into the future is, how do you limit, uh, minimize the gatherings and facilities like rec centers and libraries and places like that? Um, it is actually easier because what we're gonna do is have a very streamlined process on Doc where you come in, you need to be called to the T, you hit the T, you move off. We're gonna have longer intervals. You can't have more than four people in a group you, and they're gonna be walking. And so you have to ensure that social distancing in that. So it's easier to manage it in that world than it really is in some of the other locations. I have asked staff and I'll get to that in a little bit. So what I heard, I'm gonna go back to what I heard from the governor. So what I heard is groups of 10 or more um, we still need to be focused on teleworking. The 50% threshold on teleworking is still in place. Um, you know, I heard retail for pickup. 
there may be a different kind of arrangement after the first. Um, and so when we take some of those, that guidance, what we're having to do when, I, when we look at our facilities is to say, what is the best way to stage that? And why are we trying to stage it? And what are we trying to open? So we have put together a team of staff to begin looking at three facilities, Civic Center, Development Service Building, and Service Center. If council will remember, those were the last three that we had open and we closed them when the stay at home order was implemented. Right now, what we're trying to do is to ensure that we can put everything in place that we need to again, meet the best practices and what we're hearing in terms of the interaction. So one of the major challenges for us in all of these facilities right now is actually putting up glass or plexiglass at the counters where people can interact. And um, we actually had to, to get plexiglass from the museum uh, because you can't find plexiglass now. And believe it or not, glass I think is cheaper than plexiglass. And so we're having to order all of this stuff. So we literally are using plexiglass from the museum. I think they're using, they may be using the little, the robot cutting machine at the museum to build the, 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 the framing for it. And they're putting that in place. And so even if we were able to open, if we don't have the proper safety measures in place, I'm going to delay that until that occurs. And that's what we're really looking at at facilities. So we started with those three. Council may remember we never closed the public safety building because they already have the glass partitions in place there. So that's continued to operate in this. Um, we're also working on municipal court. Municipal courts also having to take guidance from the Supreme Court in terms of what can occur. That's our first phase. Our next phase then moves into some of these other buildings where we have more people and and you know, right now, there is a lot of work to really understand what we can do, how we can do it, whether we can accommodate it, but we're not at the point now to say that we can do that in a safe manner. Um, one more question about that. Um, I've run into uh, several people trying to get in to pay the utility bills. Mm -hmm. and I've said, do you know, they're not going to cut you off, but, uh, and you can pay online, but I can tell by the way they look at me. They don't. They don't have a way to pay online. Mm -hmm. So that's what a lot of people are, and I think that's especially a problem with people who don't, who've lost their jobs, and you know they don't have. Well, they just have a lot of problems. But they 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 are very anxious about being able to get it, get to pay their utility bills with the person. So right. if we could just arrange something. For that, that would be very helpful. And that's part of what we're looking at. To give you a sense, every work group in the organization, we have tasked them with creating a plan and a very detailed plan in terms of how they're going to open. So I can talk to you about the utility billing component in terms of, so we're putting up all the glass at the counters where people interact. If they're dealing with someone at the counter, even though there's glass, they're still going to be wearing a mask. Um, and we're going to have safety protocols in place. We're trying to get hand washing stations in so that people can utilize them. In utility billing, we used to have two lines. We're going to one line, very similar to grocery stores where you have adequate social distancing and where people can stand. We're going to have signage talking to people about what they can do. Those are all the things we're trying to put in place as we look at the future in terms of what we're trying to accomplish. Um, I will tell council this. I will not authorize anything to be pushed forward that, that doesn't uh, meet the standards established by the CDPHG, Boulder County Health, CDC, and we're taking all of those things into account. So it is highly likely that you will hear from me um, in the near future, we've been able to achieve the requirements established by the health departments and we can open golf courses. But that also means we can enforce and maintain that on an ongoing basis. And a lot of folks go, well, are you going to be using volunteers to do this? No, you're not. We're also going to repurpose staff that aren't able to work in other facilities to come in and help us provide that service. 
I've also said we're going to, it's going to be walking. We will not even entertain moving into carts unless we have the ability to sanitize those to the level that we need to for people to use it. So if anybody ever sees carts going, away, that means we're hitting the, sanitizer, the sanitizing protocols that have been established. We've also created processes within the organization to say, if somebody tests positive, here is a set of protocols that we're going to use to clean the facility in order to ensure that it's sanitized when people come back into it. And we have a robust set of requirements that I've signed um, last week in terms of what we're going to do. We also do health checks now in terms of anybody that's coming into work. Um, even I have to get my temperature taken. There's a series of questions in removing this. And so as things continue to evolve in the future, you will actually see an expansion of that for anyone coming into work at any of our facilities. There is a lot of guessing right now, but what we're trying to do is put enough plans in place that once we get clarity, we're able to adjust and go when we need to. But we will always have the safety of our workforce and the safety of the community in mind when we make any decision. Thank you, Harold. Dr. Waters? Thanks, Mayor Bagley. <clears throat> I, I just, uh, two things, Harold. If, I think it might be worth taking the, the list of requirements or, or parameters, or if it's a protocol, or the restrictions that you, you touched on to get that to all of us, to all the council members. So when, when we get incoming phone calls or email, we can specifically cite you know, what, what's been in writing. I've seen it as one who volunteers at the golf courses. And a, 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 just a couple of observations, just to reinforce one of your points, uh, right now, I, I, I have no idea how many people are on the golf courses today, but I know there are numbers. And in addition to what you said, there are people playing and people recreating in other ways on the golf courses. Today, there's nobody out there supervising, right? There's nobody enforcing social distancing. There's nobody to keep people away from somebody's backyard. And the only way that's going to happen is if you, if you put people out there to supervise, which is what you're talking about doing. You mentioned uh, a different schedule for people teeing off. The normal route, the normal time frame is eight minutes between tee times. It's going to be 15 minutes between tee times. Double. All the practice areas are closed. So if you arrive more than 10 minutes before your tee time, you can't get in the parking lot. Right? You go from your car right to the first tee. Right? You're wearing a mask. You're required to wear a mask until you get to the first tee. And then you, you know, you described how you're going to, but people are, oh, you can't, you can't, there's no food or beverage available in the pro shop. You've got to order that before you get there. You pick it up curbside. You can't get a drink or a, a something after the round. You can't hang out. You have to leave. The, the truth of the matter is, I, and, and I'm, I, you know, I volunteer. I'm on the golf board, but I believe actually safety is going to go up, not down around the golf courses based on what's going on now versus what's going to happen, right? And I understand the perception and the concerns about mixed messages and you know all the things we've heard from our residents, I get that. But at the end of the day, uh, I, I do believe that the residents and those who are, are live around the golf course or who are beyond the golf course will be more safe, not less safe, with the protocols that have been established. And um, to answer your point, we have um, our public information team that has built a lot of stuff and we will as we get closer, we will we will get that out to council. And we wanna make sure that we're actually able to do what we were saying we're gonna do. So I'll make sure that they get at least that first sheet to you. And then as things change, we will we push that to council. Um, Councilmember Martin, or I don't know, Mayor, are you watching? Yeah, I'm watching. Councilmember Martin? No, actually, Councilmember Edogle Ferring, did you have your hand up first? No, you're up in the corner of my screen. So just check in. Councilmember Martin? Okay, uh, this is just a quick one. Um, we talked earlier today about volunteer marshals, and I think I heard something just now that I didn't hear before. Are you saying that you are going to use only city employees and no volunteer marshals during this hypothetical reopening? We will have a, a number of city employees. I think they're also trying to manage it with volunteer marshals. But the primary enforcement mechanism is also going to be city employees. Um, I know there's a concern about volunteer marshals being able to do it. If you've ever been there, the marshals 
they they make you comply even in the voluntary component but we're going to use both potentially yeah i'm not worried about them not having the authority i'm a little worried about uh, the number of them that are uh, young enough to do it because a lot of them are retirees and shouldn't be there and we have to keep that in mind if council remembers everything that we're doing we also have to keep in mind the the, the guidance that the governor has given us this is really beyond golf this is everything that we're going to be doing we have to keep in mind the gov the the advice or the guidance that the governor in Colorado Department of Health and Boulder County Public Health has given us regarding individuals that fall into certain categories. Um, obviously, you have the age category, but you also have those that are high risk, and we have to manage those at a different level. And I will tell council we're having those conversations daily, and we're really asking people to bring that to our attention. So no matter what situation they're in. We can make the appropriate decision that we need to based on their individual condition. All right, great. Um, ready to go to Dan for the, um, but that's what we're looking at building wise, and more will be coming. I just wanted you all to know all of the processes that we're going to to try to figure it out. Dan, do you want to go with the general EOC update? Sure. Um, you did a pretty good job with it, but I'll give you a couple of quick other things. Um, in general, from the EOC, we're really transitioning at this point. We're trying to transitioning into supporting the recovery effort and really out of um, really active response efforts. Um, I think we're doing what we can to support all of the economic structures that you'll hear about next um, and really try to think about these long-term facility reopening plans that Harold was talking about. Because we're operating under the assumption that there's going to be some kind of a masking strategy until there's a vaccine. And that could be a long time out, you know, 9, 12 months from now. So we're going to need to be thinking about PPE needs for a long time. And we're still not able to really get them on, you know, through easily through the normal supply chain. We're still trying to get them any way we possibly can. So we're we're still kind of scraping for N95s and surgical masks and those kind of things. So we're making sure that if we are going to be opening up things like the, you know, the library and those kind of places, all those city employees are going to need the right PPE. So we need to be able to provide that for them. That's a big focus of what we're doing, uh, supporting the economic recovery piece, and then just really making sure that we're assisting all the departments with the, the facility reopening plans, because those things are not, um, they're not easy. And we're kind of back to where we were in the beginning anticipating the governor's orders and what those actually mean. You know, we're not entirely sure what's going to happen in a week. We got sort of a preview, but he did a lot of things that said details are forthcoming and we haven't gotten those yet. So we're really going to see what those are. We're going to have to make legal interpretations on those and make sure that, you know, we're complying with those and they're certainly going to change like we saw in the beginning. So we're kind of, we're kind of back to that again. And we're, we're trying to make sure that we're in a, a good position to respond to all that. But, that's really where we are for now, and I think uh, you'll get a lot more on the economic recovery piece here in just a second. All right, great, thanks, Harold. You're muted, Harold. One thing I wanted to say based on this is um, one of the things that's been happening with Dan's group, you know, we talked about last week that we're gonna have other mass drives, and so we have one tomorrow from 10 to 2 at the rec center. We have one then the, the Saturday, I think, 10 to 2 at the rec center. Same schedule the following week. They've really been working with a lot of community groups. And so one of the things I want to let you all know, and this is a really big shout out. Um, I know Council Member Christensen talked about hidden treasures and the work that they've been doing. Um, the owner is actually a retired nurse um, and, and basically decided when this all started changing, um, that they would make masks for nursing homes, assisted living centers, and then just others in town generally. Um, that soon transformed very quickly into let's get long masked up. Um, since then, they've um, donated supplies to over 50 community groups. And as of this afternoon, they've handed out over 7,200 free masks to the community. And so what I wanted to do to you all is to say, what ama an amazing representation of the community coming together. And I want to give a big thank you because we actually received some of those masks, I think, and we're using that for our crews that are in the field because 
if we're out there and we're in the public, we're going to be wearing masks. And so I wanted to give a big thank you to Hidden Treasures um, too here in Longmont and I wanted to let you know the great work that they're doing. Um, next, we will go to the business assistance update. Hey, Harold, can I just say, uh, just real quick, um, just something to keep in mind and digest. Uh, they did not get a PPP loan um, and they've got rent of about, I think it's $6,000 a month. So um, just something to digest over the next seven days that uh, they put everything on hold and really provided a service. I've never met the, the owners. I don't know these people, but I do know that they're a startup that uh, took a pretty heavy hit. So um, they stepped up without expecting anything. And so I, I think that as we, uh, anyway, I, I would not be opposed at some point um, to uh, return the favor. It wasn't expected, but I think it would be appropriate. So just something to think about the next seven days. And then um, I'll mention it at the regular session. Okay. Good transition because we now have Jessica and Joni. They're gonna talk about all of the work that we've been doing from the business assistance side. Uh, I'm gonna mute myself, Jessica, Joni, take it away. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Joni Marsh with the City Manager's Office. So I know it is no surprise to Council that the business response team that has come together with our public, private, and nonprofit groups um, has rapidly developed numerous strategies around the economic recovery that we're looking um, to assist with. When Advanced Longmont 2.0 was adopted last year as a collective impact model, I know all of our organizations really embraced that opportunity to really put us in a position where collectively we would be stronger than we were individually. I think we just didn't anticipate that we would be putting that collective impact model to work in an event like the pandemic that we're doing right now. Tonight, Jessica and I are going to provide council with a high level overview of where we're at so that both council and the community understand the strategies that we're working towards to assist the business community. We've also included tonight in your packet, I believe Don sent you a fairly detailed list that gave you information on timelines, actions taken to date, as well as the three different survey tools that have already gone out since March 13th. And um, we're gonna keep it fairly high level tonight. And I'm gonna turn it over to Jessica to talk a little bit about the three prongs of the strategy we've been looking at. Jessica, we can't hear her. So, you know, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Joni. Um, good evening, Mayor Bagley and council members. As Joni mentioned, um, on March 13th, uh, a group of the Advanced Women Partner Organizations did convene as a business response team to address, um, help businesses address and connect them with resources to uh, get through the public health crisis portion of what we're going through now, as well as to start looking at how we bring resource to economic recovery going forward once we're able to start reopening for business here in Longmont. I just want to mention that uh, participating organizations in the business response team have been City of Longmont, uh, Longmont EDP, certainly the Longmont Downtown Development Authority, Longmont Area Chamber of Commerce, Boulder SBDC, Visit Longmont, and Workforce Boulder County. So really all of the organizations that are that currently are and will continue to play a critical role in helping us to recover from this uh, from an economic perspective. And next slide. The work that we've done so far, and as Joni mentioned, the supporting documentation that we provide you provides a complete timeline of when we've convened and the work that we've done. But the work that we've done so far and will continue to do going forward focuses on really three areas of capital, communication, and education. We're gonna talk, spend most of our time on this presentation talking about the capital portion of the work that we've done and the strategy that we have going forward. But just wanted to mention a couple of things that we've done relative to communication and education within the community to also support economic recovery. Uh, so far, what we've done to address the capital needs of the business community has really been preparing ourselves for the next phase um, for businesses to be able to reopen and start to look at how they recover from this economically. 
And so we've done a number of uh, surveys to help identify what the capital needs are and other needs of the business community are relative to uh, the situation that we find ourselves in today. Uh, as you know, the city is uh, assessing no penalties for interest or tax filings that are not paid, um, but does encourage businesses to continue to file their taxes and those who are able to pay. Um, Boulder County is allowing for a delay of property tax payments until April 20th uh, without delinquent fee or was until April 20th. And the Chamber and DDA have really taken the lead in advocating for possible options for additional concessions on future property tax payments as well. Uh, all of our organizations are serving as a gateway to federal funding programs through the SBA and the CARES Act as well as possible in helping local businesses to connect to those resources that are available to them. In fact, the SBDC will be hosting an alternative funding sources webinar, uh, I believe this week, uh, for those uh, businesses that weren't able to take advantage or weren't able to benefit from PPP or IDA loan programs as of yet. And we are, we did launch and are maintaining an up-to-date inventory of all available loan and grant resources on the COVID-19 Business Resource Hub, which can be found um, at longmont.org slash COVID-19. And there are links to it on all of the partner organizations website as well. So it's really a consolidated uh, online resource hub for our business community. Uh, from a communication perspective, uh, so far um, we've been reacting and uh, pushing out information as quickly and as in, time, in as timely of a manner as possible uh, as we have it. Going forward, we're looking to be more strategic and more consolidated. Jessica, if you can hear us, we can't hear you, or maybe it's me. Oh, I lost my, is that better? Can you hear me now? Anyone? You're back, yes, we can hear you. Okay, it's you you're, I think, yeah, my mic dropped. Um, so I was talking about communication, how going forward, we've uh, taken a subgroup of business response team and really made them responsible for a consolidated communication strategy around economic recovery. So as we need to collect additional information from the business community or push additional information uh, out to the business community, we now have a team that's made up of uh, representatives from Longmont EDP, Chamber of Commerce, EDA, and the city of Longmont. So all that uh, uh, consolidated and coordinated going forward. And then from an education perspective, I really wanna recognize, especially the SBDC, who's really been creating on-demand content from an education perspective to inform and educate about um, everything from uh, the different federal resources that have become available as they have become available to you know, use of remote teleworking technologies. Uh, Longmont EDP uh, just recently partnered with a Colorado Group a Real Estate Brokerage to present a session on an online session on uh, tenant and landlord relations. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce has hosted a number of town halls with our state and elect state and federal uh, delegations. And so really everybody's just kind of pursued our um, where we have the greatest expertise and resource to identify content that we can bring to a table to educate our businesses, not only on resources that are available to them, but helping them to adapt to a new normal as we start to understand what that new normal is going to look like. So that's just a broad overview of our three areas of focus and the work that's been done so far. Um, if I can get to the next slide, we'll uh, drill down on, I think, what's uh, been top of mind for most, which is the capital piece of that overall strategy. So we have been uh, surveying our businesses to get an understanding of what their needs are. The results of those surveys, summary results of those surveys are also included in the supporting documentation that we've provided. And so what we heard from our businesses is that not that um, small grants of 2000 or 2500 would not be appreciated, but that they wouldn't be that impactful in terms of helping businesses to reopen and potentially reco recover once they're able to reopen. Um, and so uh, we've been working with uh, DDA, um, City of Longmont City Manager's Office, Harold and Joni, uh, to identify uh, resources that we can bring to the table, financial resources that we can do bring to the table to develop and deploy a meaningful grant program, specifically focused on recovery and uh, helping businesses to uh, 
meet their needs and uh, provide them with an infusion of cash uh, to get reopened and up and running and ramp back up as quickly as possible once there's opportunity to do so. And so uh, through financial resources provided by the City of Longmont and Longmont Downtown Development Authority, Authority, our plan is to make available grants that will provide that infusion of cash to help qualifying businesses reopen. Um, we're currently in conversations with the Longmont Community Foundation about administering that grant program. Obviously, that's where their expertise are. Uh, those details in terms of what that administrative relationship will look like uh, have yet to be finalized, but um, Eric has been very helpful and resourceful in trying to figure that out, and we expect that to be finalized um, within a matter of day or days. With this Economic Resilience Grant Program, qualifying businesses would be able to apply for a grant of up to $10,000, with proceeds being able to be used for any legitimate business expense in accordance with state and federal law, uh, including but not limited to rent, payroll, inventory, meeting the public health and safety requirements, uh, so buying plexiglass and, and other things that will be required for them to get up and running under new restrictions, as well as other operating expenses. We're looking to financially support through this program, non-home-based businesses with a physical address within the city of Longmont that are preferably locally owned and operated and have been in operation since at least January 1 of 2020. Uh, they would have to have an active city of Longmont sales and use tax license and be in good standing with any city permits, licenses, fees, or taxes as of March 1, 2020. Um, I will mention in good standing because the uh, there is a um, or the city is working with individuals on uh, paying their sales and use tax license. So as long as they've been in, in that situation, as long as they've been in communication uh, with the city and the city considers them to be in good standing, whatever that looks like under the unique circumstances that we're uh, in today. Um, we're really focused on supporting small businesses, uh, truly small businesses that are employing uh, 50 FTE or fewer full-time equivalent employees or fewer and have in some way been impacted by this crisis, whether that's temporary closure, dr dramatic reduction in operations, loss of revenue due to the public health orders related to the COVID-19 public health crisis. We'll go to the next slide. So where's, where, what are the funding sources for this program? We are redirecting, look in my face. We are redirecting uh, the $60,000 in grant funds that the one EP typically um, administers for the city. They had been directed towards the Innovate Longmont Startup Grant Program. We're redirecting those to fund this resilience grant program, as well as uh, your commitment to support uh, a program uh, with $30,000 from uh, council contingency. The DDA is also pitching in um, at least $60,000 um, from their development incentives, incentive funds specifically available to downtown businesses. Uh, Kimberly has said that they are looking at potentially being able to contribute more to the fund, but they will commit at least $60,000 to this fund. And the final piece of that plus funding is going to be in the form of private contributions. So we will be fundraising to bolster, leverage those public dollars to really identify private sector dollars that can support um, a, a grant fund and hopefully at least match the amount of public dollars that are going into the program. Part of how we're going to do that is we will be designating this fund as an enterprise zone contribution project, which gives us the opportunity to offer a 25% discount, uh, discount, sorry, tax credit, income tax credit to anyone who um, is contributing to that fund from the private sector, whether that be an individual or a business. Um, and so we're seeking to raise, like I said, at least uh, a match to those public dollars that are included. So that would really uh, give us at least um, $300,000 in, in um, that fund if we're able to successfully do that. Again, we are really focused on helping businesses to reopen and recover. And so in terms of an actual launch date for the Grant Economic Resilience Program, we're really waiting to hopefully within the next few days get some additional guidance um, or better understand the guidance from the governor's office around when different types of businesses will be able to reopen so we can start to make this available when it's going to be most impactful for those businesses that are reopening and refueling, restarting our economy. Go to the next slide. 
I'm going to actually turn it over to Joni now to talk about some of the other uh, programs that we're working on relative to the capital portion of our strategy for resilience and recovery. Thanks, Jessica. So as we mentioned, we did a series of surveys um, at the very beginning of the stay at home order. And what we've looked at doing next is we've actually taken all of the contact information from the city's sales and use database and co combined that with all of the databases and resources from the partner team and are going to send out a comprehensive needs assessment to all of those businesses. Our BRT communications team will put together strategies as well as ways for businesses to opt in or out of those continued emails um, and assessments. But what we're really trying to do is understand what the magnitude of the economic and financial needs are in our community right now. And then how do we look at not just this grant program, but how do we um, direct other recovery funds that, that might be coming um, from federal financial resources down the road that are either sitting in the CARES Act and being looked at by our OEM team or additional funds that may come out of the federal um, next federal federal funding package. We've also talked about our CDBG funds and the 2020 funds potentially being repurposed for both individual assistance and economic assistance. And I think Kathy will talk to you a little bit after this about what that's looking like. We also received an additional allocation of CDBG dollars um, out of the CARES Act. So Kathy is doing some uh, figures of how that money will be split out between individual assistance, economic assistance, as well as the COVID Recovery Center um, in Boulder. And then also there are additional resources that the DDA has. Um, they've already applied and, and received a $10,000 um, grant from the Colorado Creative Industries. Um, they're looking at putting, as Jessica noted, another $10,000 in funds out. And then they'll also be looking at another $200,000 in their 2020 budget that could go towards another program, perhaps rent relief. Um, and Kimberly is, I believe, watching this evening. And if we have further questions for her, um, we can try to get her in to answer some of those, or perhaps we can follow up with council specifically on DDA programs. And Joni, this is just, obviously this is Jessica, sorry, I'm getting used to this. Um, I did just get a text from Kimberly that she wanted me to clarify that uh, the additional funds, the other DDA funding for economic relief uh, is going before their board for a vote tomorrow. So it hasn't been approved yet. Okay. This is what they're looking at in terms of putting additional resources into these efforts. Thanks for that correction. And, I, and with that, I think that is the overview that Jessica and I had for this evening. We would be happy to answer questions. Um, or follow up and also would direct you to the additional detail and welcome any questions, emails that you might have beyond this evening to, to either of us. I've got, I've got, I don't see any, I don't see any uh, heads up, but I've got a question and that is of those 150,000, maybe 300,000 and it's up to 10,000 each for each small business. How, do, do, do we have any, I, I mean, that obviously 300,000 divided by 10,000 leaves us with 30 businesses, yes. but it's up to, do we, do we, do we have a goal of how many small businesses we'd like to reach? How many we'd like to help? Um, is it, what's the, what's the criteria for getting the 10,000? That's a tough one with limited re oh. Okay. That's a tough one with limited resources, right? We've seen um, other uh, communities that certainly have much deeper pockets, but I don't think there are enough resources in the world to um, address the situation we're in. PPP went through $350 million in 10 days, so, or billion dollars in 10 days. Um, and so we know, I mean, it, it's, it's going to be tough. This is, you know, we're trying to put dollars out there that are going to be as impactful as possible. Could we have, you know, put together a fund of $300,000 and put out $2,000 grants to, or $3,000 grants to 100 businesses? Um, we could have, but we heard, what we heard from the business community was that would not be impactful. And so by looking at businesses that are, um, that have the potential to reopen, that maybe have a barrier to be able to reopen or ramp back a business, bring back employees, by focusing on those business businesses, we think with limited resources and a limited number of businesses that we're going to be able to support through this program, 
that's the best investment for taxpayer dollars with the highest potential long-term return. And that's one of the things that we'll be looking at is, you know, initially what is um, the reopen ramp up uh, increased revenue, bring back employee strategy for that company as part of our decision making process for them receiving a grant. And then there has to be able to track that information over time. Um, but it, I mean, it's tough. We could, you know, I mean, it, we could do hyper micro grants or loans to hundreds of businesses. Um, but what we understand from them is that's not going to be impactful. That's not going to get them to reopening, hiring employees back up, ramping um, back up, uh, getting the inventory and supply chain um, that they need uh, uh, to get this economy again. So, and then next so question. Can I, can I jump in on that one too? Yeah. So I think there's two things to that. One, obviously, um, we've talked about with council and, and Kathy will talk about this is, the potential inject of CDBG dollars into this total amount. So that's an that's another number that will come into play um, based on conversations that we have with you all. Um, the thing that I did want to focus on on this too is really this unmet needs analysis that we're going to go through with these businesses. That's incredibly important because as you start seeing, and for those of you that were here during the flood, you, you, you may remember we did an unmet needs assessment for the entire community. That information is going to be incredibly important because as this continues to evolve over time and other funding sources become available, the more that we're able to articulate what we're really seeing within our community, the more that's going to help us when other possibilities start developing in the future. So those are two components that are pretty important. Um, you know, a lot of cities, just to be frank, a lot of cities have put money out there. Um, we were really trying to take a bit data-based approach in terms of what business is needed as we were evaluating this. All right, and then last but not least, one of the criteria, so I'm assuming based on, actually I won't even assume, um, you said that uh, the businesses to apply need to be in compliance with the city sales and use tax permit. Mm -hmm. So does that mean that we're only going to be working with retail establishments and not service providers? No, all businesses in the city of Longmont are required to have a sales and use tax license, whether they generate sales and use tax and file or generate sales and use tax or not. Um, okay, so that, that's what I was asking. It does they don't need to necessarily be paying sales and use tax in order to have access. Yeah. All right, perfect. Yeah. Other point I wanted to make very clear is you don't have to be a member of LEDP, DDA, Chamber of Commerce, or any of these. This is community wide that we're really looking at, and that's something we've been very focused on. DDA dollars have to stay in the DDA, but outside of that, um, it's citywide. And so we'll really look, really look at because there's that match of, of dollars for DDA um, that will be able to direct those dollars to the DDA, which would give us the opportunity to direct even more dollars than we would otherwise have um, outside of the DDA as well. So create more equity um, in uh, the overall grant program. Awesome. That's that's really cool because. Uh... I've, on, on social media, we've been asked constantly about, well, what are we, yeah, what's the city going to do? Yeah. What's the city going to do? So yeah. th this is a great response. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. One other thing I'll just add, um, I'll start to plug the fundraising for uh, the private dollars or the philanthropic dollars into this fund is there's 90,000 people in this community. You know, everybody gives $10 and uh, that becomes a lot more impactful than um, a handful of, of uh, businesses or individuals. Um, giving a couple thousand dollars a piece. Right, good point. Anybody else? All right, Harold, anything else? No, we will go to Kathy and Karen for the individual assistance piece that will Thank touch you. on some business. I think Council Member Waters. Uh, yep, Dr. Waters. Yeah, just on Jessica's last point, um, it, it, she may have mentioned it and I just missed it. Uh, if, if somebody had a question, Jessica, just to follow up, wanted to pony up $10 or, you know, some amount of money, who do they write a check to? And is it going to be the foundation, the community foundation? Where would they, where would they make the donation and how would they make the donation that's uh, most efficient for your, for you or for those managing the fund? Tomorrow is when we, 
get together and really start to dig into those details, um, what the application looks like, um, finalize uh, an administrative agreement with, um, hopefully with the community foundation. It's our goal to have, um, to partner with the community foundation on this. They do this and they do this well. And so I don't have the answer to that, but it likely will be the community foundation. We'll be coming back to you with the final details and all of that information on marketing and communication strategies so that you can hopefully support that um, when we have that and, and hope, and that will be soon because we're trying to get um, this up and running as um, businesses start to have the opportunity to reopen. Long-winded way of saying, I don't know. <laughs> Harold, Ashley, okay. Um, Kathy, Karen, next. So Kathy, you're going first. Okay, I was hoping it was gonna be you first, but um, so Karen and I have been um, attending a lot of the different county um, focused meetings with um, City of Boulder, some of the other communities, City of Longmont and Boulder County folks. Um, regarding individual and household assistance, really looking at gaps and needs in those areas. Um, and what we have found, I think, um, to date is that the um, county has access to a lot, a number of resources um, that are coming into play immediately to help people um, with that individual um, assistance, things such as emergency TANF funding that can be brought in to cover um, any family with children uh, that has an income of less than 50% of the area median income, um, housing stabilization funds, and a number of other different resources. The other thing we found is our family resource centers in the various communities have been doing a great job of raising funding and distributing that money quickly. Um, so we have really, oh, and then housing counseling and mediations, both um, with the, the communities as well as the Boulder County Housing Counseling Program that the city of Longmont um, uses CDBG funds to fund has really been <clears throat> um, stepping up and helping um, negotiate um, concessions with between tenants and landlords and mediating um, where needed. And then also working with um, foreclosure prevention and um, forbearances for folks with mortgages. So um, we have been, um, taking all of this into consideration and trying to figure out where are the, the gaps and the needs that are gonna be popping up um, either here pretty soon or as we look further into the, um, into the future and trying to be strategic with where we place our um, community development block grant funds. As um, Joni indicated, we are looking at repurposing some of our 2020 funding, um, which we'll be bringing back to you on May 12th hopefully, um, as well as the additional funding that we're receiving from HUD and how to allocate that. And even today, we got a new area that popped up uh, where a gap in need that we need to take a look at. So we're trying to pull all this together really quickly and um, have it ready to bring forward to you with our best um, recommendations on May 12th. So Karen, what else might you want to add? So uh, good evening, Mayor and Council, Karen Roney here with Community Services. So as, as Kathy mentioned, uh, since mid-March, we have been involved in daily conversations with the government funders, the community foundations, Mile High United Way, um, to really talk about all the resources that we have available, how are we going to leverage the resources, to really make the greatest difference uh, to individuals who are struggling in, um, in, in our community. Twice weekly, we hold a community, we call it community partners conference call. And that's where we're, we're bringing in all of the different providers and they're talking about what needs are they seeing. So, um, so we hear from our health clinics, we hear from childcare, uh, this afternoon, we had a conversation with the St. Green Valley School District and Boulder Valley School District, and um, and so they they talked about what they're doing, but they're also they also talked about what some of the needs are of the students that um, and their and their families, and so that information really helps us, as Kathy mentioned, to identify 
where do we have the greatest needs and what are the best resources we have available to apply to those, um, to those needs. So um, in terms of what, what is happening locally, so for the City of Longmont funding, our Human Service Agency funding, um, we don't necessarily have additional money to allocate, but what we are doing is that we're working with the nonprofit agencies. So if they are wanting to repurpose their money uh, for a different service than what they received um, a grant for, we are entertaining that. We have, um, we've reached out to every uh, agency that we fund. And some of those agencies have requested an early release of those dollars. So rather than a quarterly payment, um, we might release two quarters. One agency asked to have their entire year released. And so we're really trying to be flexible with what they need to be able to um, provide the service that they are, um, that de meet the demands that they are uh, receiving now. Our, um, Lama Community Foundation has been a great partner. They have raised over $100,000 and turned that around pretty, um, pretty quickly to, um, to agencies. The Community Foundation of Boulder County has raised over $1.2 million. And they're using that same needs data that Kathy and I have access to to help um, roll that money back out into the community to meet, um, to meet the needs. The, there's a state COVID release. Um, relief fund for which Boulder County agencies can apply. Um, the last figure I had is that they raised over $10 million to support nonprofit agencies that are serving their communities and um, and they are allocating $25,000 grants to those agencies and several Boulder County agencies uh, did get in the queue for the first funding round. So the um, so just a just a, a couple of things. One thing Kathy did mention is that we are are trying to reinforce any time that we can that people that are um, may not even realize that they're eligible for some of the CARES Act assistance and resources. That that's really we're trying to encourage folks to access those services first. Um, that's over two billion dollars that has come into Boulder County to address some of the things that Kathy talked about. So not only food assistance, but healthcare with um, you know, Medicaid and um, Child Health uh, Plus programs, um, additional rental assistance, unemployment assistance. So we're really encouraging um, community members who maybe have never had to apply for assistance before to really go after those dollars that are available through the CARES Act, because those, those dollars are gonna make a huge difference in people's lives, um, probably much more so than what we're able to do locally. Um, and, and just to, to put in a plug is that for um, for folks that need healthcare that might uh, apply for Medicaid and they haven't um, been able to find a, a provider that, that will take Medicaid, um, just wanna let you know that Salute Health Center here in Longmont as well as Clinica that serves the rest of Boulder County are, um, they have capacity they need funding, um, and so they certainly can accept uh, the Medicaid um, clients who, again, who maybe haven't had to access health care um, through Medicaid before. The other, uh, just the last thing that I will um, indicate is that there is, uh, on, on the Boulder County, uh, bouldercounty.gov website, they have that a great resource for those affected by COVID-19. Uh, they have rolled out what they call their housing helpline. It's a special number, it's 303-441-1206. And uh, folks can call that. They have to, they leave a, a voice message, but they get a, a return call back um, right away, or at least within 24 hours. There are uh, two people on, on a full-time basis that are staffing that. And they really are, um, they match people who call in to that number with the most appropriate resource that they would be eligible for. So they're kind of triage specialists, but ultimately it's, it's to help them get the kind of resources that they need, uh, both the staff people who are um, uh, staffing that line are bilingual. And, um, and again, they try to link people who call to all benefits um, that they would be eligible 
for. So um, but I think that's really the high level overview that we wanted to, to provide. Um, having a, a team of folks throughout the county, um, sometimes we have 20 upwards of 90 people on a, on a call, but we're all working together. We're all trying to uh, leverage the resources let people know about new resources that are available that maybe we hadn't um, known about in the past to really um, to really try to provide uh, the kind of relief that um, that folks need. Even though we won't be able to meet every need, we're really trying to maximize the um, resources that are out there. And so Kathy and I would be glad to answer any questions you might have. Joan. Actually, Councilmember Peck. Mayor Bagley, Karen, thank you for that report. I was wondering um, if you could let people know where they can donate money um, per the list that Carmen uh, came up with and you emailed to me, and let us know who, who is going to manage those funds. Um, you mentioned uh, the Hour Center, you mentioned, well, I'll let you. Okay, <laughs> great. Yeah. Yeah. Because, um, uh, thank you, Councilmember Peck. And you know, one of the other things that I think is important to, to mention is that we are working very closely with our, our cultural brokers throughout the uh, throughout Longmont and Boulder County community because um, equity um, and access to resources and services is really important that we um, that we pay attention to. And so, um, so again. The, um, the Lamont Community Foundation is, uh, is, is accepting donations. The uh, Community Foundation of Boulder County is accepting donations. And we'll make sure we'll put this on the website. I think Council Member Peck, to your point, um, there's also a, um, a foundation called Philanthropy that is, is also making, um, is also doing some um, basically at requesting donations really to, um, help families that might not be eligible for some other kinds of governmental funding. So, um, so again, they are all working together to try to raise uh, funds for, uh, for folks that particularly that might not be eligible for some of the other assistance that is, um, that is available there. And we are, um, we are doing our best to try to fund or um, instead of trying to stand up a new service or, or something like that, we're really trying to uh, funnel dollars into existing um, service providers that are already, that have the system set up and they already do this, um, this work. We're just asking them to do it on a much larger scale than they've ever seen before, ever. So, um, so we will get that information on the website, Council Member Peck, so that people know where to go to, um, to, to donate. Okay. Right, Sorry, go ahead, Joan. Sorry, didn't mean to interrupt. That's okay. Um, so just for a little bit of clarification, because my uh, initial interest was keeping people in their homes who were having difficulties uh, either, either negotiating with their landlords, owners, property managers, whatever, and, and also looking at the property managers side of it as well. They need that rent to pay their mortgages with. So, and, and this is what Susan Spalding does very well is that, and I was wondering, is there, what is the method for that part of this uh, effort to request the funding to help renters? Is that, is that there from the, from all of these? And is there one point of contact yeah, I think yeah, that's a great um, that's a great point. So, Councilmember Peck, I would say the the best if, if folks are looking for one place to go, um, I think that would be the housing helpline. And um, and again, that is three zero three four four one one two zero six. I do believe we have that on the city's website. We should have a link to that because what what the um, what the housing specialist will do is they'll 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 start with, you know, what can we do to help, you know, self-resolve? So, for example, they would link um, a caller to Susan Spalding, who runs uh, the mediation program for the city of Longmont. 
and and you know because they might have they might determine that hey maybe the best course of action here would be for Susan or some of our other volunteer mediators to work with the landlords and the tenants to try to work out work out a solution. So 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 they kind of have a, a triage funnel they call it and really trying to work through how might um, a household be able to resolve a situation through mediation and and what folks really are going to need in infusion an infusion of cash um, to do that. And City of Boulder has a mediation program. City of Longmont has a mediation program. And through this effort, Longmont is taking on more communities as well as the, the City of Boulder, since not every community is, is blessed with that resource that we have in Longmont and Boulder. So between those two programs, we're covering the entire county for that mediation service. Thank you. That was exactly what I wanted to know. Thank you. All right. Anybody else? All right, Harold. Do you have Karen? Good, Harold, Karen, Dan. Uh, Thank great. You, Harold. It's back to me. I think one of the things I wanted to before we transition to Jeff real quick is one of the things I wanted to say is, you know, this has really been an interesting situation for us because if you all remember, again, I can't make analogies to the flood. When when the flood hit, we were able to go. Here's what the need is for businesses and here's what the need is for homeowners you could identify it you could touch it you could very specifically get into this i think where this is much different is that the need for every individual and every business is different and it's really getting in and understanding and having that conversation um, and getting into the very specific issues that they have to deal with and so we have a lot of folks doing really great work at getting there at this point, I will turn it over to Jeff Zayak. Um, you all know Jeff. Jeff is director of Boulder County Public Health. Um, I want to say, as he comes online and unmutes and puts his video on, um, Jeff's been great in terms of returning my phone calls. Um, and when I go, well, what does this mean? What does it need to do? Um, and he's really been a, a good part, great partner for the city. And so I just wanted to, to let you all know that um, He's been there when we needed him and been there to answer questions. And so, um, Jeff, Susan's going to be running your presentation, so take it away. All right. Thank you, Harold. Thanks, Mayor Bagley, council members. I appreciate being invited back. Um, and one of the things that strikes me as I've sat here for a little over an hour listening is how fortunate we are to be in Boulder County and how fortunate we are to have municipalities like this that can support our communities in uh, such a drastic and significant time. So uh, I think people are very lucky to be living where they are, and I appreciate all the work that you're all doing day in and day out. Uh, and if you can queue up the first slide, and I'm gonna be on this slide for just a minute. I wanna, before I switch, I wanna just talk about a few things that are important to just remember as we move forward. And really where I wanna focus is on, um, I'm gonna go fairly quickly through some of the data um, and not belabor it. Um, but I do want to talk about what some of the things are that are going to be important as we move forward. And then I want to talk um, last about what I know at this point about the change in the order from the governor, when we might expect to see different things and how that might play out. Uh, so just, I think I want to just take a second again to remind people that what we're looking for as we move forward, especially as we consider um, loosening up some of these orders, is we want to continue to see decreasing cases we track cases daily in Boulder County. I'll show you some of that data. We wanna make sure that our hospitals have the ability to handle a surge um, and that they don't have to use crisis standards of care. I don't believe any hospital at this point in Colorado has had to resort to that. Um, our hospitals certainly have not. We wanna be able to test symptomatic people both now and as we move forward. Um, and we want to make sure that we have the staffing to do isolation, quarantine, and what you've probably heard so much about in the news, contact tracing, which is just essentially making sure that when we have somebody who tests positive, that we have enough staff to be able to do um, investigations with all the people who were near that positive person and that they are voluntary quarantining um, and monitoring their symptoms. And that helps us assure that as we remove portions of orders and move forward, um, having those pieces in place helps us assure that we can hold that surge down and that it doesn't go back up. 
Uh, and then the last thing is just making sure we have a good surveillance and monitoring system uh, so we can evaluate changes as they occur with these changes in orders. Um, and what we're seeing right now is hospitalizations. I'll tell you when we're going to switch to the slides, but um, I want to just maybe give you a few broad overviews. We are definitely seeing hospitalizations across the Front Range metro area uh, continuing to slow and stable. So the orders absolutely are working. We know that. We know that they've been effective. Um, and I want to thank anybody who's listening in our community who's taking this um, seriously and they're not going outside unless they have to. And um, as Dan had mentioned earlier, no matter what scenario we're in as we move forward, uh, until we have a vaccine or a treatment, we are going to be in a social di distancing um, strategy. So social distancing is going to continue to be part of our lives uh, for months and months and months in advance until we have a vaccine in place. One of the most important components of social distancing is the wearing of masks. Uh, and there's been research uh, that's been looked at recently. Masks definitely have the ability to reduce the spread of this disease. And when I'm talking about masks, I'm talking about general masking for the public. Uh, the governor, after we learned that we have asymptomatic um, spread, which we've known for a little while, and that droplets could potentially travel further than we initially thought, the governor and CDC did the mask recommendation, and it is really important that we continue to mask or cover our, our nose and mouth as we move forward into the, into the weeks ahead, um, because those things do stop us from spreading that virus to somebody else, and that's really important, uh, especially where we can't maintain that social distancing. So when we're getting into tighter spaces, it's harder to maintain six feet between each other. The mask is really an important tool for us. Um, so if everybody could just keep that in mind as we move forward, that's going to make a huge difference on how things, how successful we are as we move forward. I wanted to uh, call your attention to an area that is a, is a challenge for us at this point, um, and that's our long-term care facilities. When we look at our data, um, we are seeing slow growth in terms of new cases, but the growth that we are seeing is associated with our long-term care facilities. And that's a worst case scenario. It's, and it's not just for us, it's for the state, it's for other states around us. Uh, unfortunately, um, the, some of those, uh, those infections started weeks ago. And once an infection gets into a long-term care facility or, or a, a, a nursing facility, it's really difficult to control those outbreaks. And we are on the back end of that. And we are seeing some of those things happen right now. Um, so we are doing a lot of work um, and have been for, for several weeks now, really working closely with those facilities to try to do our best to control the spread of disease in those facilities. And what we're finding is that um, many of those facilities uh, were the spread occurred from asymptomatic um, people who were not showing symptoms. Um, and it was it's really important to, again, think about that masking requirement as we're out in the general public. Uh, so we want to make sure we continue to focus on that. We are uh, the most the most concerning thing, and the reason that we're paying attention to this is because, um, in addition to the huge uh, heartache and loss for people whose mothers and fathers this is, um, we also know that this can become another one of those surge points on our hospitals. Uh, and to see the kind of uh, impacts and fatalities we have in these facilities is heartbreaking. So we want to spend as much time as we can trying to control this. These are our high risk folks, as everybody knows. Um, so we have been working closely with our hospitals. We stay in contact with them uh, on a weekly basis. We are tracking data associated with them. And we do have a plan in place so that if the hospitals start to see additional surges associated with long term care facilities, they will support each other. Um, and and so if one if one hospital has ICU beds that are starting um, to surge, another hospital has uh, agreed to come in and, and support them so that there is some capacity in our own communities uh, until our surge facilities uh, are getting built across the, the Metro Front Range. Um, and that is uh, towards the end of next week and into the middle of May until those facilities are ready. Um, so now we can shift to, to, the, to the next slide and, and I'll, I'll clip through some of this data fairly quickly. Next slide, if you can.
Any, oh, sorry, I wasn't. I didn't see it switch on. <laughs> I apologize. Um, so. Uh, this is our, we collect data on a daily basis. So this represents our total cases as well as our new cases. And that bottom line is the one that I told you was important to track because we're gonna expect that cases grow over time. We want them obviously to eventually plateau, um, but we wanna track that bottom line to see what our new cases look like. Um, and this was case counts as of yesterday. I had to send this presentation out in the evening. Um, so I did not update these as of today. Um, but this represents yesterday's case, case counts. And you can see that we still have large number of cases in long-term care facilities. Um, I will talk a little bit more about total case, total case counts in a second, but next slide. So this breaks out um, the, the rate of cases per jurisdiction based on a population of 100,000 people. And what I wanna make sure that people remember again, when they're looking at data like this, our testing is inadequate at this point, and we know it. Um, we, there is a statewide group uh, that the Governor's Innovation Task Force has put together that's been working on this. It's being informed by Metro Public Health Directors and their staff um, that have formed a task force to feed information into that. So what you're seeing here is just based on the number of cases that we have identified as positive in each of the cities, but it doesn't by any means represent comprehensive testing in all of our communities. Next slide. Uh, this is just a reminder that this impacts ages um, across the age spectrum. Our number one uh, largest number of people who test positive are in that 20 to 29 year old group. Uh, and then secondarily 50 to 59 year olds. Um, and we still though are seeing our highest uh, death rate in the ages above 60. And we know that's because it does um, definitely have an effect on, on folks who are older, and it definitely uh, has an effect on people who have underlying conditions. Um, there is more uh, concerning data that the experts are looking at in terms of potentially longer term impacts associated with even younger people uh, who might get the disease and end up hospitalized because of some of the scarring uh, that can happen with the lungs. So there's, there's more to, to be told on that as we move forward. Um, but the disease definitely is, is impacting people across our age groups. Next slide. Um, what this shows is just the distribution of where the cases have come from and what you would expect early on before the orders were in place. Uh, travel was a big piece of how cases got to Colorado and how cases got to Boulder County. And that has shifted over time. Um, the orange represents community transition. Uh, so community transition went up and it is now peaked and is starting to decline. And the blue bars represent um, uh, cases that are we that are spread based on close contact. So this would represent where you would see the long-term care facility um, cases as an example. Um, so we can see that the community spread has gone down and more of the individual the individual case spread is happening. Next slide. This is our data on um, on uh, our race and ethnicity. And what we're seeing is not different than what we're seeing at the state level and what we have known to be the truth for a while. Uh, we know that we have impacts in our, in some of our, um, uh, some of our populations that are marginalized. And it is, this disease is not discriminating uh, against anybody else um, that we see in the normal data that we look at. So it's unfortunate as an example that we see 28% of our cases almost um, of COVID in, and 13% of our Latinx population. And we know that that is a disparity that needs to be righted. What we see when we look at some of this data is that a lot of these folks are on the front line. They're not people who can work from home um, and they're out there every single day. And so we've been working with the state health department. Uh, we've been working with our, um, uh, our folks here in Boulder County uh, that have been working with these populations to, to really look at how do we actually make changes in what we're seeing in these populations as we move forward? What kind of policies do we need to be thinking about? It's again, another area where we know we're gonna have to focus and think about what shifts do we need to make in order to right some of these equities that we're seeing. Next slide. Uh, this is the three-day average growth in number of Boulder County residents with confirmed or probable COVID-19 cases. And you can see that there's a general downward trend. That's really what I wanted to, to illustrate here. Um, and what we know is that if we remove long-term care facility cases, which in the last two weeks um, have really 
um, been the primary sources of new cases, that this graph would even decline more quickly. So again, from a community spread standpoint, those orders are working. We are seeing improvement in Boulder County, and we really need to focus now on making sure that our long-term care facilities are supported in the way that they need to be in order to reduce spread there. Next slide. Uh, I won't spend too much time here just to say that on the bottom of this graph in red is the Boulder County rate. So our rate is lower than or, uh, uh, or almost exactly the same as one other county, but we are lower than most all counties. Um, so what we're doing here is working. Next slide. Uh, this is the hospitalization data that I mentioned. So this is not, this has a, is a delayed response because of the reporting system. Um, so this doesn't have current number of cases, but what's important to pick up here is to see that there's an initial surge and then there's a slowing um, of cases that are being hospitalized. And we meet with our hospitals week by week so we can ground truth this. And what we're hearing from them is that in fact, this is what they're seeing as well. So we know that this graph, graph is representative of what we're actually hearing on the ground. Next graph. Uh, this is just our death rate again illustrates that um, in any death uh, obviously is too much um, but we have one of the lowest death, death rates in the metro county area and it represents uh, some of the things that you saw from those earlier graphs again unfortunately what we see is the majority of these deaths are associated with long-term uh, care facilities um, and it is a sad situation for sure next next slide please this is syndromic surveillance, which is just the data that we get from our hospitals. It's real time data and I haven't updated the graph. I'm sorry, um, but we get data day to day on this. And what it does is it allows us to look at another indicator that demonstrates um, COVID-19 like symptoms that are getting reported at the hospital on a day by day basis. And we've continued to see this decline. It's again, just another indicator that we're doing well here in Boulder County. Um, and that the things that we're doing, people are following and it's making a difference. Next slide. Uh, this is just an example of the, the data dashboard that we track. So that we track uh, multiple hospital information across all of our hospitals. Um, and then we have a dashboard that indicates, so we can see pretty quick, quickly where we are with some of these things, but it's, I know you can't read these, um, these letters, but it's um, med sur medical and surge bed, capacity, it's our ICU bed capacity, it's the number of vents that are currently in use in Boulder County, things like that, as well as PPE um, for hospitals that we can track on a, on a daily and weekly basis. Some of this data is reported daily, some of this data is reported weekly. It's again, just another indicator of the things that we're looking at closely to make sure that we're not getting to a point um, where we're having a problem with surge um, relative to our hospitals. Next slide. So some of the next steps, and then I'm going to move right into um, what the difference between where we are now and what it looks like with the governor's change in orders. And one of the things that, that I think is important to point out is you heard me talk about those key components that need to be in place as we move forward. Um, and those key components include testing and workforce to, to do containment. We are working hard on both of those things. The one challenge that we have right now at a statewide level uh, that I'm, I'm sure you all have been hearing about and are aware of is testing. And we know that we don't have the number of tests available uh, in order to meet all the testing needs uh, across the state of Colorado. And we especially know that's true of as we move forward um, with releasing um, portions of orders to be able to have the amount of testing that's needed to test everybody that we would need to, we're just not there yet. So the governor's task force presented to us a couple days ago. The biggest issues associated with that are supplies, supplies specifically associated with swabs and some reagents. Um, and the governor's task force is working hard. They're looking at how can they work with other businesses in the state to, to find other supplies. People are, are even considering the 3D printing kind of thing that I bet you've heard about uh, on the news as well. Um, so there's a lot of work being done around bringing more testing into the state. Um, and we'll just have to keep tracking that and see how we're doing uh, as we move forward. And then that that really does push forward the importance of the social distancing and the masking. So whether we're successful and how this moves forward is going to be, is going to depend so much on how we all individually take responsibility for these two things, um, because we don't we all know we don't have enough 
staff to make sure that every single place is following social distancing, um, that as people are outside more that they're maintaining uh, the, the, the six foot distance or they're wearing masks. Um, but we know it's going to be critically important. So what we don't wanna do is move into opening um, up more businesses or, um, or loosening the orders and then have people ignore these things or think it's not important because what will happen is we'll see resurgences as has happened in other countries um, and other states. So we really wanna take it seriously, uh, make sure that we are doing everything that we can to take personal responsibility uh, for the social distancing and for the masking because those two things will be part of our future as, as again, uh, Dan mentioned, uh, until we really have a vaccine or a treatment in place. Uh, we're gonna talk about development of social distancing gui guidelines in a second when we get into the governor's order. Um, and the other thing that we are doing, uh, knowing that we don't have quite the testing that we're gonna need as we start to move forward, is we're developing an enhanced surveillance system here in Boulder County. And we're also working with uh, the surveillance group at the state to, to look at these same kind of measures. There is um, some self-reporting that's been launched at the statewide level where we can actually, people have the ability to, to uh, report their symptoms online and then get linked up uh, to a testing facility and would have some electronic follow-up as well as some in-person follow-up. We wanna be able to use that, that uh, reporting system to be able to find out if we're starting to see more cases pop up or more um, symptoms pop up that way in Boulder County. We also are working um, with our Office of Emergency Management and working within our 911 system, we can look at some of the data um, that's in there and we have a way to be able to collect that that will give us an indication if we start to th see things. Um, we are working with our long-term care facilities to collect information. Uh, we've been reaching out to our hospitals to get data before it's just reported as a hospitalization. Um, and there's several other components that we are working on um, as well. Uh, on, on the administrator's call today, one of the things that came up was even using our, our police department to uh, thank so much to every single one of them um, because they are, they are the boots on the ground, they're the eyes on the street, and they can help us uh, tell if some of these social distancing pieces are working or not. Um, so some of those kinds of things are the kinds of things that we focused on here in Boulder County to assure that we're doing everything that we can to make sure we're successful as we move into some of these next phases. Next slide. So the, I mean, the next three slides here are gonna be the difference between where we are now and the difference between where we're moving to uh, after the governor's order expires. And the, the box on the left-hand side right here that says stay at home is where we are now. What we know is that we are in a 75 to 80% um, social distancing scenario now. So what that means is that the orders that we've had in place have achieved a 75 to 80% control on the spread of the disease. Um, based on what we've had in place. And with the governor's uh, order and change, he is moving to the 60 to 65%, which is safer at home. Um, so after April 26, we move from stay at home to safer at home. And then the differences um, are what you're gonna see in these two boxes. So stay at home now. The first one that you see is, is different is when we get down to um, retail at the bottom. Uh, and you see it's only open to critical businesses right now. And after Safer at Home come, comes into play, it's open to, um, to more businesses than critical with curbside delivery and uh, phased in public opening with strict precautions. What I can tell you is that we don't know anywhere it says with strict precautions or guidelines in here, um, the state has told us that they will take a lead to help us make sure we're developing statewide guidance that applies to everybody across the state. We have not seen that guidance yet. We understand that there will be work this week and into the weekend on this, but we have not seen what any of these things look like at this point. Um, and that's been probably one of the biggest questions on all of your minds. And it's one of the biggest questions on all the public health directors minds as well. We have done some of our own work and, and provided that to the state so that they have some things to, to start from, but we are still awaiting that guidance. Next slide. Uh, the next thing that we see as the major difference is in offices. I heard reference to this already earlier in the presentation tonight, but we are going from a place where offices are currently closed to a 50% open. And what I want to what I want to emphasize here is that, um, and I can tell you, we're doing this um, at, in Boulder County. We really look closely at who actually needs to be providing direct services, and where that needs to happen 
how do we assure um, through the structuring of how we set that up, um, the wearing of masks, that we can assure we're maintaining that distance or protecting each other um, from spreading the disease. So telecommuting will be maximized. Um, again, I think uh, as we move forward into these next phases, that this is going to be really important. We're gonna have to continue to think about the maximum ways that we can social distance. It's gonna be really important until we get to a place, again, where we have a vaccine. So some of these things will stay with us um, and we'll need to be keep thinking about those for months to come. Uh, the next one is elective medical services. I mean, we know that, that people have held off on elective medical services and that there is a need, I've heard this from our hospitals, um, that people really de do need to get in for elective services. And unfortunately, the other thing I'm hearing from our hospitals as well is that, um, that people haven't come in um, for critical care when they actually needed critical care. And we've seen some impacts in our community um, associated with that. So even for this next week, um, if somebody needs critical care, they definitely should go to the hospital. Um, hospitals have, they are, they are places where they are paying maximum attention to controlling the prevention and spread of this disease. So we don't want people to delay on getting care that they need to. They should call the hospital that they're going to, to let them know that they're coming, or they should talk to their um, doctor or urgent care, or whoever it is um, before they go in, but people should seek care if they need it. Um, the next one is restaurants and bars, and that stays pretty consistent for now. There is a group, although I don't know exactly when that will happen or what that will look like, that is going to start to explore what does it look like to have a phased opening associated with capacity in some of these places? Um, so I'm not sure the timing of that, who will be involved and how it gets um, uh, how it gets facilitated. But as soon as I know that, I'll make sure that, that the administrators group gets that information. And then the last slide. Um, and then this, the, the, there's not a ton of difference here except for under the personal services. Um, and I know that this means, this is a huge, this is huge um, for these for these businesses who have not been able to function at this point. And I know we've got people who um, are bankrupt associated with this. They haven't been able to continue to make a living. It's it's had serious and significant detrimental impacts on all of us, not just from an economic standpoint, but from a personal standpoint, from a mental health standpoint, from a community standpoint. Um, and it's going to have lasting scars on all of us for some time to come. So I know that this is something that uh, people are looking very much forward to figuring out how to deal with. And again, what, we'll, what we expect to see from the state is some more guidance around how does that actually happen as we move into these next weeks. Um, and then the last one is real estate and uh, the, showings, the showings can start again with social distancing, but there is a limitation at this point on open houses. So my last closing point is that is that we can make this work if we take those social distancing and those and the masking seriously. We will be focusing on more messaging around masking and the importance of masking. One of the probably the biggest question I continue to get is if I'm exercising, do I really need to be wearing a mask? And the answer to that is yes. Uh, and some of the, the latest research that we've seen actually demonstrates that when you're when you're exercising, you're expelling more um, of the particle, more of the droplets um, from your mouth and that they can spread further, especially if you're running, um, and that they can travel behind you um, and impact the person behind you. So we definitely, even though it's, it, it seems counterintuitive to people, it's important to be wearing masks as we're exercising if we cannot maintain that social distance. So uh, I will continue to be telling you that as we move forward. Let's make this successful together and let's focus on that social distancing and on that masking, and, and, I, and, I, think we can be, and I think we can move forward. I'll stop there. That's a lot. Sorry, <laughs> Mayor. Um, well, well, Jeff's taking a break <laughs> and a breath. Um, I do want to say that the you know again talk about the partnerships. Just so Council knows, uh, we obviously know we have different facilities with different issues. Um, I have, um, and Jeff knows this. We talked about it earlier. Um, said, what do we need on the surveillance side, and, and how can we be there to help support that effort and, and the work that he's doing to fill gaps if they need it from our staff. That helps me figure out some issues where we have folks that aren't able to come into facilities. So that's a that's a big piece of it. I think um, on the surveillance side, the you know the other side is um, the Jeff suggestion is, you know, we're gonna be working to encourage more of that compliance with mask in the community. 
Um, and then the last thing I want to say is, and I've said this before, and, and we'll keep saying it, is we each have responsibilities. We have responsibilities as governments and we have responsibilities as individuals. And at the end of the day, what I'm gonna say is we really need individuals to, to, you know, to wear the mask when they're coming in and they can't manage that social distancing because it's up to each and every one of us as an individual in terms of how successful we're gonna be in this in the next few months. And so you will see that drum roll really start coming out of our PIT group. Thanks, and, and Jeff, uh, that was that was awesome. You can tell that. Uh, just thank you so much for all the effort and work that you've put in um, uh, over the last couple of months. Uh, Harold and the staff have nothing to nothing but glowing things to say about you. We really, really, really appreciate you and the county's efforts. Thank you. Thanks, Mayor. Anybody have any questions for Jeff? All right. Well, thank you. Please keep doing what you're doing. Thank you, Mayor. Appreciate Thanks, it. Council members. I appreciate it. All right. Anything else? Hey, Jeff. Sorry we went longer than we thought. <laughs> That's okay. Appreciate you, man. All right. With that, the, if there's, is there anything else from city staff tonight, Harold? Um, no, I do have one question. Um, and this was something that we emailed you all about. And this is also part of what we're trying to do. Um, in terms of some of the work that we're doing with storytelling and other things. Um, but I wanna ask each and every one of you as council members, um, and we're trying to grab this video uh, for many reasons. Um, what would you like the community to know at this point? And Mayor, I'll let you figure out how you wanna go through that, but we wanna know what you would like the community to know. What do, what do you mean on COVID, on what you're doing? On on COVID, what do you want the community to know about COVID and what we're going through? I, I think, I don't know if I, we, can, we can go through it, but I think that we just want complete and total and utter transparency and sharing of data so that everybody knows exactly what, what the threat is, what we're doing to counteract it, um, both the health impacts of the virus and the health impacts that come along with the economic uh, challenges we face. And I, I think uh, just a, a constant presence on our website that that shares complete and full disclosure to the extent possible would be would be welcome. I don't know about specifics. Anybody else have any specifics that you want shared? Uh, Councilmember Christensen. Um, well, a lot of people have a lot of people on city council have already done some videos. Uh, I haven't seen them all. I saw Tim Waters, which was very good. Um, I shot one today, but um, I guess what I would like people to understand to know is that this is not some kind of, in my opinion, this is not a curse from God. This is something that pandemics have happened since the beginning of time, and they will always happen. And we just need to um, follow the rules because we know what works, we know what doesn't work. And um, I would like people to stop using the term lockdown, which is a prison term. And it is it means you're locked in your six by eight cell and you get fed bad food through a hole in the door. That is not what we're in. We are in voluntary or, you know, we are in, um, diminished social distancing. We can still buy groceries. We can still go to the liquor store. We can still uh, go to the hardware store in an emergency and get gasoline and we can walk outside. We can order things online. We can get takeout. We are really not in anything like a prison situation. The city is still providing services with roads, water, sewage, electricity, forestry, police, fire, we're still having Susie Hidalgo firing is still teaching. Um, people need to not feel like they are being put upon. We're all in an uncomfortable situation, but it won't last forever. You hit your mute button, Polly, you hit your mute button. I muted myself. There oh, well, it's all right. <laughs> But, um, you know, this will not last forever. Most people in town have responded with uh, 
kindness and compassion and understanding. And that really encourages me. It's a great, you know, we're, most people in town are really um, creative and funny and dealing with it well. Don't listen to the ones who are not because they're never going to be happy. Councilmember Martin. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. I'd like to tell everybody, because I've been talking to a lot of people uh, at all across the political spectrum, and if they support the governor, they're saying, oh, this is too soon. We need to, we need to really keep our social distancing, and we need, really need uh, to stay at home, and everybody's going to be out. And if people are worried about their freedom, and uh, then they're interpreting the change of the, the end of the governor's uh, stay-at-home order as uh, uh, a get-out-of-jail-free card, right? They're they're interpreting it as as oh wow, you know, the restrictions have been lifted. What I'd like to do is to urge everyone to look at that last slide that we have from the governor's office and really understand how very little has changed. This is mostly about putting people back to work because what it really does is allows the reopening of businesses that are not high contact in terms of, of how they interact with the public. Um, that's going to put a lot of people back to work, but what everybody needs to understand is, yep, do what you've been doing and look for the places that can be relaxed, but don't assume they're relaxed. Just do what you've been doing. If you're if you're older, um, like I am, you know, if you're in, in, then keep doing what you're doing, because for us, nothing changes. And um, we're going to get through this if we do that. Pay attention to the specifics as they come out. And only when you see a specific change in the order, then change your behavior. And otherwise, just be safe, everybody. Please be safe. Councilmember Yudago Fearing. So, um, yeah, I think I would just kind of want to echo the same sentiments that I'm hearing so far. I mean, we all have a, a part to play. We all have a responsibility in being safe, you know, utilizing a mask when we're out in public, um, you know, and it's more about protecting the people around you and out of respect and courtesy and um, of public health and the, the people in your surroundings. Um, that piece. And I mean, and really, yes, I was thinking about the slides um, as um, Council Member uh, Martin had stated, not a lot has changed. I mean, schools are still closed. And a lot, you know, all of us teachers, I mean, I've been in this spot since 730 this morning doing lessons <laughs> with the kids. Um, <laughs> so, you know, we we've had to all make adjustments and um, and have had to be really inconvenienced tremendously but we all have a part to play and we all have a responsibility and due diligence to be safe stay at home when you don't have to be out so, um, so the sooner we can get out there um, you know i want to also oops something popped up on my computer sorry um, you know i just uh, i've lost my train of thought um, like I said, I've been here since 7.30 this morning with students. <laughs> um, but yeah, just um, take care of each other um, and, and be kind to one another. I think that's the strongest message I want to give, give out to everybody. Thanks. Dr. Waters, you're next, Joan. Thanks, Bagley. Um, thanks, Harold, as well, for uh, asking uh, or inviting um, opportunities to reflect. Uh, 
council member christensen mentioned a video i did post a video uh in and tried to be you know try to articulate the, the four kind of r's for me to get through this responsibility being the first of those and i want to come back to that Harold mentioned it but reliability as well uh because we all need to depend on one another right that we all get it right because if one of us doesn't everybody suffers um uh, resilience that no matter how hard it is, how hard it is to comply and i know it's easy people might look at this and say it's easy for you you're retired uh you you're not living with some of the pressures of young kids at home and the economics of this and it's easy to say we're all in it together uh when it's when not everybody's making the same sacrifice but sacrifice is required here and the last of the four hours for me was resourcefulness and that is we heard we have heard so much tonight from the staff about just how resourceful this community can be and is in in mobilizing to support those who need it most from our business community to folks who are housing insecure to folks who are food insecure so i want to go back just for a minute to the concept of responsibility i, I wish i could own that this definition i can't somebody else defined freedom as the will to be responsible for ourselves across the country we are seeing people uh in the in the in the in the name of freedom wanting to return to normal activities and to and to look past or disregard the kind of guidance we've had from our own our governor and public health officer and from our city manager and i just want to say for myself i i think it's true for all of us that we need to exercise our freedoms through the will to be responsible to one another uh because we it, 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 there's no doubt that we're in it together because if one of us is sick we're all at risk of being sick and it's going to require support and it's going to require the kind of personal discipline and the kind of will to exercise the freedom to maintain the responsibility and the the obligations that we have uh to those to, to science and the public health officers so um i appreciate the opportunity um and i hope we get a chance to keep talking about what we need from one another to get from where we are to the other side of this pandemic. Thanks. Councilmember Peck. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, I, I just want to thank the residents who have reached out to me with their concerns, with their questions, and to uh, let the public know that we are your conduit. You, you elected us. If you have questions, if you have issues, if we don't know the answer, we can at least find it out for you. So uh, for that, I, I, I feel that we uh, are, I'm honored to be able to be in that position to help people. And, and I wanna put out the message again that you can contact your elected officials to help you get through some of this. I know that the paperwork, going to the website, it can be overwhelming. It can really be overwhelming for people who are under stress or anxiety, but we can help you work through that. Um, I also uh, want to remind you that just because we are on city council that we cannot solve this problem. It is not up to us to figure out how to get through all of this alone and we need your help. Um, and I thank everyone who is out there helping and uh, doing what is responsible. Uh, we're very, very fortunate to live in this community. We all have our differences. We all have our uh, ideologies, our philosophies, but when it comes down to it, we have to work together. And I think we're doing a great job. So keep it up and don't be afraid to reach out to your council people we can find the answers for you or help work through the issues. Thank you very much. All right, great, thanks. I guess I'd like to take a human moment for a second. The, uh, the, uh, I was scared to death to be put in my home. So, uh, you know, I'm recently divorced. I live with a dog and uh, uh, I suffer from depression. I, I take nobody, I've never, I don't think I've ever told you guys, but I take Lexapro. Um, I've suffered from depression since about 2006. 
and uh, and uh, part of my frustration um, in this whole process, and it continues to get worse, is the political divide is being showcased full spectrum on this issue. Uh, the far left says, stay in your homes forever. The far right says, you know, let's just leave now. And, uh, and uh, I look at it and all I'm thinking is, uh, it, it, this is hard. It's hard. The isolation, the loneliness, it is tough. And, I, and so anybody out there who uh, uh, kind of shares, the, shares the, the same anxieties, um, uh, uh, a, lot of the count, a lot of my fellow council members have, have stated that, yeah, they're, they're right. The governor's order has changed a little bit, but we still have to stay in our homes. Um, and I don't know, uh, there will be a lot of debate into the future about uh, why we have been lucky enough to see, at least locally, um, not a, a, uh, an overflow in ICU beds and hospital stays. It doesn't really matter, uh, other than we took precautions. Um, Harold, the staff, the county, the state, the governor, um, uh, regardless of, of what was necessary or not, they took action and it accomplished what they wanted to accomplish. Um, our hospitals are not overflowing with our parents, grandparents, et cetera. Um, uh, but part of my frustration, um, I was one of the lucky ones. My small business, you know, I got a PPP loan. You know, um, most of everybody else did not. Uh, thank you. I want to put a shout out to Independent Bank or Independent Financial, formerly Guarantee. Uh, they had 45 applicants here locally, all but four were approved. And those four that were not approved was a result of the small businesses dragging their feet. I can't say the same for my colleagues who went through some of the larger banks. And, uh, and that just added additional stress to small business owners, at least in my situation, even those who don't take depression meds, who are just worried not about themselves, but about their, about their employees. Um, and uh, there's just a lot of people, um, all the concerns that I'm hearing about freedoms, about, uh, you know, loss of income, about, you know, the potential of spreading the disease. It is just a crappy situation to be in. And I don't care if you pick the left or you pick the right. It's just all bad right now. And I'm not saying that because, oh, my gosh, we need to panic or, oh, my gosh, this sucks. Take action. It's just we are in one way or another. There's someone in this community. Just know your mayor is dealing with a lot of the same issues you are. And uh, we need to buckle down. It's not going to last forever. And uh, the next step is opening up our businesses, getting people back to work. And uh, but we do need to be careful. And so uh, uh, I ask everybody just to do what the governor says and uh, we'll get through this. And in the end, we'll be stronger for it. And so that might be in a week, it might be in 12 months, but uh, regardless, just hang in there and, and it will end. So that's my comment. So all right, anybody else before we go on to council comments, although we've all had some comments. Ah, there he is, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez, yes. Uh, thank you, Mayor Bagley. Uh, just a thank you to all my fellow colleagues here on council uh, for keeping calm and putting out good information to folks. I think that's very important in uh, this day and age. And thank you very much to the staff for also keeping us informed on a daily basis on uh, everything that the city is doing. You know, I think the city with the strapped resources that it has is providing uh, great resources for our businesses and for folks out there in the community. Um, I think as we all know, there's a lot of anxiety and fear and frustration in the community on both sides as, as Ryan uh, touched upon. And I think that, you know, exposes some frayed nerves. And I just want to urge people to be very patient with each other as we're out and about in public, you know, the limited time we are out there. Because I don't think anybody's really used to social distancing or wearing masks. And sometimes you could be at the grocery store and somebody gets a bit closer to you than you might like. Let's be patient knowing that they're probably not doing this with ill intent, per se, but that it's just a, you know, a slip of the mind maybe a little bit because uh, again we're just not used to living in in this manner uh, so be patient with the people that are out there as well as the people that are working out there you know our grocery store workers and our clerks and, and all the folks that you see out and about I, I am 
uh, lucky enough that I, my business is still working, but I still have to be out there in the public. And it's, it's very scary to people, you know, having to go into their homes. And uh, it's scary for me, it's scary for them. And it's just all about remaining calm, being patient, and trying to work through this the best we can. And so, you know, let's just uh, be good neighbors to each other because this is a community. And we'll only get through it if we can uh, really kind of rely on each other to, to pull through. So that's all I got. Amen. All right, anybody else? Does anybody have additional council comments at all on any other topic? Although I can't imagine. Yes, oh, there you go. Councilmember Peck, you win. Yay, I win. So actually, Mayor Badley, this is a, a question for you. Um, I had heard anecdotally the uh, Metro Mayor's Coalition uh, had set up a fund to help small businesses. Uh, and I don't have any way to see if that is a true statement, if that actually happened, um, that they have donors that are contributing to this fund. And if that is true, is that uh, available to Longmont small businesses? Let me check. I have not heard anything. But then again, uh, but yeah. then again, they did call yesterday or two days ago and said that for some reason, the emails are getting locked up through the city email. So my, the recent one. So Harold, I'll talk tomorrow with, with uh, uh, the tech folks and figure that out. Good question, I'll get back to you. Great, thank you very much. Yeah, because I'm missing them too then, because I didn't get it either. Okay. Uh, Council, uh, Councilmember Waters. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, the Senate passed um, package number three today. Does, does, does anybody know, I, it's my understanding there was a fair amount of money, multiple billions of, the, for state and, and municipal revenues to offset shortages? Um, I haven't seen that. At least what they're putting out right now is more related to business. And so the four, what I'm reading, it, the Senate came to agreement, $484 billion bill would inject um, the $320 billion into the PPP program. Um, 60 billion would be set aside for community-based lenders, smaller banks, and credit unions to assist smaller businesses. And then I also know that there's some funding in it for hospitals. Um, that's sort of a high-level view that I've received thus far. I, I was, for some reason, I know that was part of the negotiation. I thought that it had been squeezed in. Apparently not. So it may have. I mean, they're just covering right now the big pieces of it. All right. Thanks. Councilmember Hidalgo Faring. So then this new, um, this bill that passed, would it then allow for uh, credit unions? So it, before we had smaller, um, you know, the banks, but it didn't uh, allow credit unions, is that correct? And so this one would? Um, Your lender is a credit union? It looks like of the 320 billion, 60 billion is going to be set aside for that group. Okay. Again, we've got staff that'll be digesting this in detail once it starts coming out. Okay. And um, okay. And then um, yeah, uh, several. And I think even the um, Longmont Public Media had asked about video. I'm working on it. I'll get it to you. I promise. <laughs> on his way. All right, anybody else? Councilman Martin, I see your eyes. I see you thinking. Anything you want to say? No comments, Mayor. <laughs> All right, Harold, do you have anything? Um, no, I, well, I have a quick thing. I just want to thank Council for taking my calls when I'm calling you all any, who knows what time I'm calling. Um, and then just your patience as, as we move through this. And, and I also want to publicly thank staff. Um, what I wanted to say is um, I did an interview the other day and they go, well, what inspires you? Um, and I really need to, to, to say this about my staff is every day I see something amazing and something that they do to benefit the community or benefit individuals that really inspire me. And, uh, so I wanted them to hear that and I wanted the community to hear that because they're doing great work 
and um, they're moving at breakneck speed. And to Council Member Rodriguez's point, if we could all be patient with each other, that would really help us. Um, but I also wanted to thank you all for being patient with us um, and, you know, understanding of just the, the amount of work that's going on right now. So, Council, I wanted to thank you for that. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Harold. You, anything else with that? No? All right. Eugene, anything? No comments tonight, Mayor. All right, guys. Well, thank you all for doing Oh, actually, you know what? I do have one more thing, and that is uh, something that Harold brought up. As we move forward, I'm assuming that we all want to continue doing the WebEx because uh, uh, is there, I, I don't, I mean, I personally don't think we should uh, get together in person. Um, should be until maybe a little bit later. Does everyone feel comfortable continuing to do this? That was my response, considering that some of our, our council members are more golden than others. Uh, Councilmember Martin? I'm no spring chicken. <laughs> well, I I feel very much golden, and I think we should uh, continue to do this remotely. I really hope that we get back to participatory democracy soon, and and get into a state where we can have more public participation than we're having now. But that will come in good time. I want everybody to know that I've got a list. Um, because I think a lot of of issues are being revealed by this stressful situation that you know it it's it's showing the the it's showing up the points where the fabric is is weakest and and that's where the council needs to get together with staff and we need to work on strengthening the weave for the next time um, but now is not the time to do that. Now it's the time to hold the line. And when we can get back together and get the public participating, then there are going to be a lot of things to be taken up and a lot of lessons learned. All right, Council Member Christensen. Um, I share uh, Council and Martin's uh, <clears throat> feeling about Letting this go for a while, um, I think it sets a good uh, example for the community. Um, and, you know, it's been such a, it's been a mess already because we're meeting in the library where we can't have the public really come, not many people. And so it's all kind of a mess. We'll just, we'll it all sort out just like the flood did. It's, you know, we're still trying to fix the stuff from the flood. We'll be fixing this for a while, but it will all come round. However, you know, we've been putting off on many, many things that are uh, more controversial and we have a big backlog. So, and I, I don't want to hear any of those things without the public being able to participate. So when we get back to semi-normal, whatever that may be in terms of this city council, um, <laughs> I think we'll all be very grateful. So we can let that go for a while. In the meantime, they can always call Mayor Bagley and yell at me. <laughs> All right. The uh, anybody else? Councilmember Peck, I saw your hand go up. No, anybody? All right. Then if there's nothing else, it's that time to adjourn. Do we have a motion, Councilmember Peck? Of course you do. I move to adjourn. I'll second that. Second. All right. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, say nay. Aye. All right. All right. Motion passes unanimously. Councilmember Peck, we are adjourned. All right. Thank you, guys. See you next week.